grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. 400 years. That's how long it was. 400 years God's people waited in silence while once again finding themselves under the iron fist of an occupying government, this time the Roman Empire. 400 years in between the end of the Old Testament and the arrival of John the Baptist, who was a prophet sent by God to prepare God's people to receive that promised Messiah, that Son of God in the flesh. What was God doing for 400 years? What was the purpose of 400 years of silence? Well, before we answer that question, there's one very important truth we must remember about God, especially during this season of Advent when we, as God's people, look forward in our own time, as we, during this season of Advent, look forward by first looking back to that fulfillment of Christ's first coming that helps us to look forward to the promise of his second and final appearing. And what we must remember as we wait is what St. Peter says in 2 Peter chapter 3, a text that we look at many times during the Advent season and for good reason. Peter says, do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. Though to our finite human minds, 400 years no doubt seems like an eternity, to God, 400 years was nothing more than a breath he took in between sentences. The Lord is not slow, as we understand slowness, Peter says. No, as Peter says, he is patient with you. That 400-year span between the Old Testament and the New Testament was nothing more than a breath for God. A sigh, if you will. A sigh of patience. A sigh of long-suffering with a sinful and rebellious humanity. A breath and a sigh of mercy. Of grace. As God silently and patiently, in the silence, brought his people back to repentance. That's what Peter said. He's patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. That's also the very first word that comes out of the mouth of John the Baptist once the silence is finally broken. John says... Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And then in the very next chapter of Matthew, Matthew chapter 4, we read of how after Jesus is baptized by John the Baptist, he's led into the wilderness. He's led in there as our perfect substitute and sacrifice as he himself perfectly endures temptation and waits on God. And upon coming back out of the wilderness, what are the very first words you hear Jesus himself say as he starts his ministry? Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The 400 years of silence wasn't silence at all. The silence was God shouting at his people to get ready. The silence was a deafening cry from God to his people that they should prepare by looking back on the words that he had already given through his prophets. A cry that they should look back in faith on what God had already said. 
His silence called them to believe. It called them to wait upon the Lord. His silence made them prepare. And most of all, God's 400 years of silence was a patient call to repentance. For it's only in true repentance towards God that a way can be made ready in your heart to receive the fullness of what he offers in Christ. This being the second Sunday in Advent, our focus is on peace. And the famous passage from Isaiah, chapter 9, verse 6, tells us and promises that the Messiah that's coming is going to be called the Prince of Peace. Peace was the proclamation of the angels to the shepherds in the field when they announced the Prince of Peace was born. They said, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. Now that begs the question, doesn't it? Whom is he pleased with? If peace is for those with whom God is pleased, then who are the ones that God's favor rests upon? Well, God's peace comes in repentance. God is pleased with those who repent who empty themselves and receive by faith the fullness of what he has done for us. King David, who like you and I was very familiar with the need to repent and very familiar with the need for peace with God, that same King David says in Psalm 51, you will not delight in sacrifice or I would give it. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O oh God, you will not despise. The peace of God, the peace of the Prince of Peace who has come, is not found in false confidence in religion. The peace that we desire and the peace that we need from God is not found in proper theology for theology's sake. It's not found in pietism or holy living. The peace of God is not found in simply going through the motions of the things God has commanded, like animal sacrifices or like coming here every Sunday and just going through the motions. The peace of God is found in repentance. Peace comes in repentance. However, I want to make sure I make one point very, very clear before we continue. Repentance itself doesn't bring peace. Repentance is not just some formality. True repentance not just some empty religion is what brings peace. Peace comes in, not through repentance. Jesus and John the Baptist both did not say, repent so that the kingdom of heaven can come near to you. It's not something you do in order to bring God closer. True repentance is a response to the fact that God is at hand. Repent, for the kingdom of God is here. Repentance is the only response one can have when, through the eyes of faith, you see that kingdom in the flesh in Christ. That kingdom of God that confronts the sinner inside of all of us that's worthy of God's wrath, worthy of his condemnation, and certainly worthy of the death our sins deserve. But that same kingdom of God at hand in Christ who was born a man to die for the sins of men and who did die and rise again so that the kingdom of God would be restored to the true repentant remnant of Israel. 
as we read in our text today, John had some pretty harsh words for the religious elite that showed up to be baptized, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. John said to them, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruit in keeping with repentance. Clearly, as you read the account, they knew who John was. And John was very familiar with who they were. They didn't come to receive the baptism of true repentance that John gave. They didn't come to repent, believing that the kingdom of God and the Messiah was at hand. They came because John had attracted a whole lot of people. It says the whole region was coming out to be baptized by him. And they perceived John as a threat to the glory that they desired to have in the eyes of men. The Apostle John tells us in his gospel that John the Baptist said and taught, He, Jesus, must increase and I must decrease. And that is true repentance. The religious vipers that came to John did not come to decrease. They came, hopefully, to increase for themselves. To put it frankly, in modern day language, they were already full of themselves. They were already full of their own self-righteousness, full of their own religion, full of their own pride, full of their own thoughts and opinions. The Pharisees and the Sadducees lived for their own increase through man-made religion. And if being baptized by John meant that they could have more from the people, then so be it. Let's go get baptized by John. 2,000 years later, sinful men are still doing the same thing, aren't we? When was the last time that you hurt in your soul to come to church? When was the last time you simply could not wait to get here on Sunday morning for no other reason than to hear those words of God once again tell you, I forgive you? When was the last time you couldn't stand still until you got to come and kneel at the altar and taste salvation. To be relieved as Christ comes to you personally in repentance and restores you. When was the last time we found ourselves to be truly and completely empty? wholly dependent on everything he has to offer to fill us. John the Baptist told the Pharisees and the Sadducees, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. And don't presume to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father, for I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. Even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees, and every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. What is the fruit of repentance? Well, it certainly isn't anything we are capable of. We could never be sorry enough for our sins. Truth is, we can't even remember all of them nonetheless be sorry enough for them. What is the fruit of repentance? Well, the answer is, it's nothing. It's emptiness. It's being nothing. Having nothing. So that we can come to the one who gave everything to us. The fruit of repentance is emptiness. The only hope we have of bearing fruit in our lives, of escaping that axe that's at the root of the tree, as John says, the only hope we have of bearing fruit that will glorify God is to come to him empty so that we would be filled with his goodness 
in repentance, we bring our empty nothingness to him. And instead of being filled with our own desires, instead of being full of ourselves, we receive his promise delivered to us who gives us every spiritual blessing, Scripture says, in Christ. In repentance, to put it another way, we deprive ourselves for the sake of receiving him. I very much like what the author John Bloom says about the hope that is found in our self-deprivation and repentance. Deprivation draws out desire. Absence heightens desire. And the more heightened the desire, the greater its satisf satisfaction will be. It is the mourning that will know the joy of comfort. It is the hungry and thirsty that will be satisfied. Longing makes us ask. Emptiness makes us seek. Silence makes us knock. Peace comes in repentance because it is Christ that calls us to repent. It is his Holy Spirit that convicts and brings us to repentance. And it's the love of God in Christ alone that doesn't just fill us up, but makes us overflowing with the peace of God. That peace with God in Christ who took our sins upon himself when he went into the River Jordan and got baptized and put it all on so that he could walk it to the top of Golgotha and bleed it all out for our life and salvation. John the Baptist came to prepare a way for the Messiah through a call to repentance and through a baptism of repentance. And it's in repentance that our emptiness is filled to overflowing with the peace of Christ. And as you read through the Gospel of John and his account of John the Baptist, immediately after John's teaching that he must decrease and the Lord must increase, we read a story of Jesus doing just that, filling someone to overflowing. Immediately after the, John the Baptist said that, he tells us the story about Jesus meeting with a Samaritan woman at the well. And like you and like me, she was empty. But she was trying to fill that void with so many other things. In her case, it was men. Five of them, to be exact. Five husbands. And the one she was living with and sleeping with at the time wasn't even her husband. So Jesus, in his love, patience, and mercy, confronts her about those men. He calls her to repentance. Jesus was calling her to give up the empty wells that she had been drinking from and instead receive the fullness that he offers. Here's what Jesus said to her. Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. In other words, what Jesus was asking this woman was, do you want to be full? Do you just want to be full? of yourself or do you want to be overflowing do you want to well up that's the promise that Christ gives to you and me and just like he did with that Samaritan woman he calls us to repent not just one day not just through the motions of a liturgical service but to live a life in repentance because the kingdom is at hand always with you Christ calls us to empty ourselves because he wants to give us more than we could ever possibly imagine. And he has. Christ desires to take those empty wells from us to fill us to overflowing. 
It's no coincidence that that's exactly what we see happening after this Samaritan woman finally has her eyes opened and sees what Christ is giving her. She overflows. She drops all of her buckets. And scripture says she runs as fast as she can back to the city from which she came, a city that had shamed her. And it was so welling up inside of her that through that one empty vessel of a woman, the entire town came to faith in Christ. Bear fruit in keeping with repentance, John said. Empty yourselves and your lives to Christ, and he will fill you to overflowing. 